Hi there, and welcome to this video on the dentistry interview, focusing on the topic of the background of the NHS. I'm Alice from Dentist Mind, where we go through the important topics of the dentistry interviews. Whichever university you're applying for, MMI or panel, we've got you covered. If you're new here, be sure to click that subscribe button. Whilst you're watching, please leave any comments below if you're unsure about anything. We've got helpful timestamps below for each part of the video to help guide you. The following video is a free sample of our full interview course, which you can buy by clicking on the link below in the description. So, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the tutorial about NHS dentistry. Today we'll start with lesson one and look at the background of the NHS and how it links into dentistry. So this just gives you a bit of information about the origin of the NHS. So it was set up to provide dental and medical and health services to patients all around the country. It's paid for by the taxpayer, which means you don't pay for it at the time that you access the treatment, which is really important because it means the treatment is available to everyone and it's not something that's set on class or income or insurance. It's a healthcare provision for everyone in the country. So one thing that's really important to note is that the NHS includes dentistry and therefore it's really relevant to you wanting to become a dental student. So what's not free on the NHS? Because not everything is fully provided by them. Well, prescriptions aren't free. So if you're the general population, a middle-aged adult, it means you've got to pay for your prescriptions. There are certain exemptions. For example, if you're over 60, under 16, you're in full-time education. However, the majority of the general population will have to pay for their prescriptions. Also, optical services aren't provided by the NHS, so if you go to the opticians, you'll be paying for your appointment. And dental services. These are heavily subsidised by the NHS, but not everything provided by dentistry is. So there's some things only available privately, and you do also pay a fraction of your treatment. So you're not paying the full cost of your treatment, the NHS will cover some of it. However, they don't cover all of the cost of your dental treatment. So how does dentistry fit into the National Healthcare Service? Well, basically, if the dentist thinks that something is clinically relevant, important and necessary um, and it's going to maintain your health of your teeth, gums um, and keep you free of pain, then it will be provided by the NHS. This isn't simply management of pain or fillings and sorting out caries. It extends to things like dentures, crowns and bridge work because it's really important to maintain the dentition as much as possible. And having missing teeth can affect people psychologically, it can affect their ability to eat. So it's not simply maintaining the teeth you have, it's maintaining as good oral environment as you possibly can. So how has dentistry evolved in the last 100 years? Because it's not stayed the same, there's been a lot of changes happen. So you kind of have this isolated approach versus a multidisciplinary approach. And nowadays we really focus on the multidisciplinary side. So a dentist isn't just focusing on one thing. They're looking at the health of your teeth, your gums, your jaw, everything. They're looking at holistically to try and give you multidisciplinary care and also referring you to different specialties. So there's a lot of different inputs into dental care nowadays that there didn't necessarily used to be. You've got specialisations. So you haven't just got your general dental practitioner. There's also people like specialist endodontists, specialist implantologists, people who are more highly qualified to deal with these complex cases and can provide the higher standard of care that some people need. Attitudes towards patients have changed. So nowadays we try to provide the absolute best experience for a patient as possible. We don't want patients to go away from the dentist being terrified of coming back. We manage their pain, we try and give them the best quality of care and if they're nervous or don't want something then you don't push it. So it's really important nowadays to respect patients and provide them with the best quality treatment that you can. There's also more um, free care and formalised frameworks. So you've got the regulations such as the GDC. They set out their nine principles, which dentists must follow. And there's more legislation and regulations in that sense as well. So dentistry nowadays is more monitored than it used to be. So other changes that we've seen, we've got now got the GDC who provide all of the legislation, the regulations, register all of the dentists before they start practising. So they maintain the high standard of care and ensure that only people who are fully qualified um, and fully follow the rules and the principles set out by them practice dentistry in the UK. You've got changes in the way disease is treated. So nowadays more advancements in technology and discoveries in the mechanisms of disease mean there's different methods of treating things which didn't used to be available. 
There's now prioritisation to prevent disease rather than treat it. So it's so much more important to teach patients about good oral hygiene and how to prevent caries than it is to be able to treat them once it's happened because we want to maintain as much natural tooth tissue as possible, which means prevention is key. There's a lot of advancing technology nowadays as well. So you've got things like robotic technology, you've got CAD CAM. So a lot of the time now you can 3D print crowns where they all used to be handmade. So that's always growing as well. Like technology is something that's developing so quickly, including in the field of dentistry. And also you've got patient-centered care. So one of the GDC principles is to always put patient's best interest first. And it's so important that you don't push care on a patient or push them into a treatment everything is their choice and ultimately they must consent to everything that you do with them and they must decide that they want the treatment fully informed you tell them everything and it's ultimately their decision if they don't want a treatment then they don't want the treatment and you don't provide it it's down to the patient about what is in their best interest specifically looking at implants this is something that can be offered on the nhs but it's only in very certain circumstances um, if it is offered it tends to be done in a hospital rather than a general dental practice but like I said, this isn't always offered because it's only done on a case by case basis. So maybe pause the video now and have a bit of a think about why you think an implant might be offered and in what circumstances it might be offered as opposed to when it might not be. So this is a question that you could get asked in your interviews. Why do you think um, implants would be offered on the NHS? So in certain circumstances, such as extreme traumas, if a patient's had a road traffic accident and this has affected their dentition, or if they've had oral cancer and maybe lost some teeth due to this, these are reasons why an implant might be offered on the NHS, whereas otherwise patients would have to go for private treatment to get an implant. In terms of cosmetic work, you've got different types of fillings offered by the NHS. You have amalgam fillings, which are the metal ones, and composite fillings, which are tooth coloured material. Normally, the NHS will only offer amalgam for fillings in the back of your mouth. Um, so maybe pause the video now and have a think about why um, metal is the only material likely to be offered in this circumstance. So the reason why the metal fillings are offered for the back of the mouth is because they are much stronger than the composite alternatives and the back of the mouth is the biting surface and a lot of force gets put on this so you want really strong material to be able to withstand this biting force and not break because the more frequently a filling breaks the more frequently it's replaced and more likely there is for tooth tissue to be damaged and lost in the process. Also, because it's right at the back of the mouth, the fact that it's metal is less of a problem in terms of aesthetics. Patients are normally not as fussed because you can't really see it. Whereas if it's right at the front of the mouth, patients will not be particularly happy to have metal where they can see it in their smile, for example. So there are certain circumstances where a composite filling will be offered on the NHS, particularly if it's front teeth. So the aesthetics are a lot better of composites because they match the natural tooth tissue colour and it means when you smile then your teeth all look the same colour, you've not got any metal showing right at the front of your mouth. Also, amalgam fillings aren't actually appropriate for certain teeth and certain types of filling because amalgam has to be held in by mechanical force, so you need like undercuts in the tooth to hold it in place. Amalgam doesn't bond directly to tooth tissue, whereas composite bonds uh, chemically to it. So. What you need if you have, for example, a chipped front tooth, you need the material to bond to the existing material left because there's no undercuts or nothing to hold an amalgam filling in place. So it wouldn't be appropriate in this circumstance. Some patients may want to have white fillings in the back of their mouth, um, but normally they'd have to go privately for this because the NHS are likely to say that um, amalgam is what they offer at the back. If you want white fillings, um, then it, number one must be appropriate, so the dentist must say a white filling is appropriate here um, and furthermore they then have to go privately to pay for it because it's probably not going to be offered on the NHS. Um, there's a slightly higher risk of failure of composite fillings at the back of the mouth due to the different mechanical properties of the material but again as there's technology and advancements happening the materials are getting better so you are getting more and more development and making composites have slightly more mechanical properties, making them more similar to amalgam. But again, this is stuff that's still in development at the moment. So now it's your turn. Uh, we're going to ask a couple of questions and these are things that might come up in interview. So have a think about how you would answer them. We'll give you some example answers as well. And basically plan your answer. Think about the information we've given you today and what you could include if an interviewer asks you this question.
This is your first question. How does dentistry fit into the NHS? So if you want to pause the slide now, pause this video and have a think about it, maybe write some answers down, some ideas and think about what you would say if you got asked this question. So this is an example answer to the question, how does dentistry fit into the NHS? If you want to have a read through it, just pause the video and read it at your own time. But we think this is quite a good answer because it draws on the scientific side of things as well as the clinical, which is really important in dentistry because you have to combine everything. It's not just a one um, direction approach in dentistry. It's very, very much um, taking in information from different avenues. Um, in terms of this answer, they have talked about the cost, which is really important with the NHS but also about clinical judgment being important and how it's all done on a case by case basis. And it's up to the dentist whether they think things are clinically important. So it's quite a good answer in this sense. So another question you could be asked is, do you believe dental implants should be offered on the NHS? If you want to pause the video and have a go at writing down your own notes or your own answer for this, then now's your chance to do that. So these are some reasons for and against why dentists should provide implants on the NHS. Um, and again, if you want to pause the video and have a proper read of these, maybe edit your answer, add a few things, take some things out, improve your answer a little bit so you think it's more um, appropriate now that you've got more information. Um, and then we'll go on to an example answer on the next slide. So this is an example answer about whether dental implants should be offered on the NHS or not. Um, it's a really good answer in that it uses a quite a balanced view. It talks about benefits and drawbacks of it, which is really important because as a dentist, you need to consider the positives and negatives of treatment and of different things for different patients. So it's not just the positives and negatives overall, it's the positives and negatives for each individual patient, which is really important. Um, this answer again has got both scientific and clinical um, stuff they've drawn on in their answer, which is really good. Uh, it can be slightly improved, but overall, if you answered this in an interview, you'd be getting pretty good marks. So that was lesson one, and lesson one is now complete. So thank you for listening, and I hope this helped you to get a bit of background information about the NHS and dentistry, um, and give you something to draw on if you get asked any of these questions in your interviews. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe by clicking below, and please leave a comment. Click here to continue watching our interview series, and to unlock full access to 70 tutorials covering core interview topics, MMI mocks, top tips and more, click on the link in the description below.